Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the trustees of the Needham Research Institute, it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to our fifth Joseph Needham Memorial Lecture. It's really very good to see so many of you following two years of hibernation. Today's lecture is made possible with the support of many. We are particularly grateful to the Jingbrand Corporation Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, the Department of the History and Philosophy of Science, and the Department of Archaeology for their assistance in uh, scaffolding this annual lecture. As always, we are indebted to the Mass and the Fellows of Clare College for hosting us in this splendid venue. It is much appreciated. Now, I can think of no better person to draw us out of lockdown than Professor Francesca Bray, who is our lecturer here for this evening. Now, Francesca has long-standing ties you know, to Joseph Needham and the Institute, uh, following her PhD in social anthropology here in Cambridge in the mid-80s. She worked as a research fellow on science and civilization for several years, and she authored the volume on agriculture, which appeared in, 19, in, in 1984. For the fans amongst you, that is volume six, part two. Now, up to this day, that volume remains the most comprehensive history of Chinese agriculture written in any Western language. Now, she then moved to Paris in California for the next decade, returned to the UK as professor of social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh, where since 2018, she has been elevated to professor emerita, but the emerita status <coughs> does not correspond to retirement. She's very busy, uh, and, and one of the projects she's currently engaged in, amongst many others, is editing the Cambridge History of Technology. Francesca is the recipient of many honors, most notably and most recently, perhaps the Leonardo da Vinci Medal from the Society of the Hist for the History of Technology. Now, Francesca is a historian, anthropologist, sinologist, and historian of science, technology, and medicine all in one. She has written extensively on technology and gender, on the intersection between technology and politics, both at the local and state level, on rice, and rice economies, food, and crops. In one of her articles, she describes agriculture as, I quote, a domain of knowledge where it is impossible to separate ideas about matter from the struggles with matter that generate them, unquote. Now today, she will tell us all about one of those matters, mud. So please join me in welcoming Professor Bray for her lecture entitled The Craft of Mud Making, Matter, Time, and History. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ro. It's, um, it's a great honor to be here and a great honor to have such a very kind introduction from such a distinguished colleague. And in fact, I'm sort of overwhelmed because uh, I think this is the first time since Simon Schaffer invited me to give a prov provocation, as we call it these days, <laughs> um, on the history of technology. And I can't remember when that was, but it was a very long time ago. I haven't spoken in Cambridge for a very long time to an audience. Just gossip. So today I'm really honored to be giving this lecture, the Joseph Needham Memorial Lecture. And my thanks go to all the people that, and institutions that Rule just listed, um, especially to the trustees of the Needham Research Institute for thinking of me as a suitable lecture, lecturer, and to the Jingbrand Company who sponsor the event among other people, to the Masters and Fellows of Clare College for hosting us here this evening, and of course, especially to my colleagues and friends here, my valued friend, Mei Jian Jun, the director of the Needham Research Institute, his wonderful colleagues, John Moffat and Sue Bennett, 
for their generous support, not only on this occasion, but steadfastly over many years, and also their embarrassing finding of old photographs, which I'm supposed to pay them not to publish. <laughs> not what you think. Um, so uh, I, I also wanted to thank two people who are not here today, and that is former teachers and colleagues, but mostly teachers, Michael Lowy, who has just celebrated his 100th birthday, and David McMullen, and both of them tried very hard to make me a true scholar. And I'm afraid they failed, and I'm not sure I was sufficiently grateful at the time, but I'm very grateful now for their efforts. But above all, of course, I'm grateful to the ancestral spirit of Joseph Needham. I first met Joseph at Friends House in London in the mid-1960s at meetings of the Society for Anglo-Chinese Understanding. And Joseph was unassuming, friendly, genuinely curious about other people's lives and ideas. He was very easy to make friends with. And this casual connection continued when I came up to Cambridge and Joseph put me on the party list for receptions at Keyes College, where he was master at the time. So when I was about to graduate in Chinese studies and casting around for what I should do next, I felt that I could ask his advice. Oh, he said, we've just, we, he always said we, we've just, begin, we've just begun work on the agriculture volume of science and civilization in China. Why don't you come along and be a collaborator? Oh, I replied, I'd love to, but I don't know anything about agriculture. Oh, well, said Joseph, you'll soon learn. <laughs> so I didn't actually have the PhD. I didn't even have my BA. I just had, you know, had taken the exams and Joseph said, come along. So I did. And I was allocated the room in the basement of the master's lodge at Keys, uh, which was full of heating oil fumes. Uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was where I was working. And it had all the Chinese texts on agriculture there, along with other books on agriculture, ancient and modern, in many languages and many states of repair. And I also persuaded Joseph that I was allowed to go to Heffers, which was then the university bookstore, and buy more books on agriculture if I thought they were absolutely necessary. Uh, we were always short of money. Anyway, I, with that and the university library and people in all kinds of departments around the university, I did indeed learn about agriculture. And I learned about how agriculture is put to use by governments and how agriculture is put to use by historians to tell the stories that matter to them. So when I wrote the history of technology, the agriculture volume of SCC, it was both as a history of technology and as a contribution to some historiographical battles at the time about what makes history tick and about which places, people, and times matter. Now, the arguments I made in the agriculture volume were certainly not those that Joseph himself had envisaged, but he accepted this very gracefully, and I thought that that was a sign of what a great man Joseph was. So who but Joseph would be generous enough, and some would say mad enough, to entrust a new volume to a callow, if enthusiastic, youngster? But I wasn't the only youngster Joseph put his trust in as a colleague. And in almost every case, it worked out, as Joseph used to say, splendidly. Joseph always enjoyed bringing young people to the Institute and into the SCC project if he could find room for them. And if we, as collaborators, received little mentoring from Joseph in the classical conventional sense, we certainly could count on his loyal support and his encouragement to pursue new ventures. This is where mud comes in. So working on the history of farming, my interest in matters of mud was inevitable. When I declared to Joseph that in order to get to grip with the technological history of Imperial China's rice reasons, regions, I needed direct experience of a kind of mud that was unavailable in East Anglia. <laughs> he sighed and he wrote the necessary letters for me to get funding for a year of fieldwork, which literally was fieldwork, in Kelantan, a remote province of Malaysia. And that picture there is of me in the mud with a buffalo. <laughs> 
I had to wear a turban, I was told, because otherwise the buffalo would be frightened. As you can see, the buffalo does not look at all frightened, but I'm petrified. <laughs> So I spent 1976 to 77 in the plains of Kalantan, learning from patient and generous paddy farmers how to farm rice. I became a mud practitioner, as we say these days, and a mud scholar. And ever since, I've remained fascinated by the material affordances and the exigencies of mud making, and by the place of this humble craft in history. Though he wasn't specially interested in mud craft as such, Joseph, as many of you will know, had a passionate interest in how materials behave and how crafts work, as well as in their historical role. And this passion for both the nitty gritty practicalities and the societal effects of material practices shaped SCC in both Joseph's own and his collaborators' contributions. So it's in that spirit this evening that I would like to offer some reflections on mud as a useful medium for a historian of technology or a historian of any kind to think about the plural temporalities of the material practices that we study, including how short-span technical processes and rhythms might be woven into the mesh of history. So I'll begin with some general remarks on materiality and temporality and on mud making as a practice of historical significance, and in particular, its role in shaping specific cropscapes, a term to which I shall return in a moment. I'll then offer a sequence of personal encounters with mud as a historical phenomenon that unfolded through my career as a historian of agriculture. And I begin with the millet cropscapes that were the material foundation of the early Chinese state around which a sophisticated system of dry, dry land farming developed. Next, I move to the rice, rice cropscape of Kelantan, where my year of field work in the late 1970s coincided with the introduction of the technological packages of the Green Revolution. And here I focus on timing to ask how the new cropping rhythms affected the transition. And my third case is the rice cropscapes of Southern China, in the late imperial era. And I explained that these were gendered landscapes in which women's rhythms of silk making were given equal weight to the timing of rice growing by men. In each of these cases, I outlined the multiple intermesh temporalities that kept the landscape, the cropscape working. And I conclude my talk with a brief reflection on the long durée of each of these cropscapes and on mud making practices as an example of the evolving attitudes to materialities that attract so much attention from historians today. So let me start just by briefly talking about mud making and time. Obviously, historians are very interested in time, and they're interested in temporalities, how they're interwoven, how to connect macro to micro, short term to long term, lines broken or unbroken, and how they connect to cycles or loops all these are obviously central concerns for historians. And for historians of technology, interesting questions arise about how and whether longer term trends or transitions connect to the shorter, shorter span time registers that are specific to particular technologies. So almost every technological change has a chronological impact. We can think of time-saving machines, industrial plans, the logistics of just-in-time production. We might think of the transformations of time consciousness induced by the disciplines of factory time, railway time, or Taylorism, or to the exhilaration of speed experienced in trains, cars, or elevators, or to the sense of history shifting as in the dread before and after of Hiroshima, or the half-forgotten pace of life before the internet, which used to be so much more leisurely. So one register of temporality that necessarily concerns history of technology, but also chemists, physicists, biologists, farmers and cooks, artists and smiths, is the pace and rhythms of matter itself. How long does a particular metal ore take to melt, or a metal casting to cool? When should I start adding oil to the egg yolks? How fast, and at what point has the mayonnaise taken 
Timing our interventions in such material processes is a basic skill, prerequisite to all the transformations of our environment that nowadays we call technology. And as a historian of agriculture, one basic technique that has particularly captured my attention is mud making. So mud making in the broad sense of the controlled marrying of crumbs of soil with drops of water to achieve a desired consistency, not perhaps what your three-year-old is doing with their bucket and spade, but a deliberate attempt to produce a particular kind of marriage of water and soil. And this is a technical process fundamental to building human worlds. So farming, pottery, building, painting, mayonnaise, calligraphy, all involve forms of mud making, taking earthy matter and combining it with water. And the importance of this transformative technique is honored in a profusion of creation myths, including those of China, in which a deity fashions the first humans from clay. So of all those technical arts, agriculture is most obviously and literally the one that depends on mud making and mud management. Farmers manipulate soil and water in a sequence of carefully timed procedures, adjusted to the contingency of weather, pests, available labor resources, and so on. And from soil preparation through sowing, weeding, and harvesting, their techniques, their tools, field systems, and calendar will typically be organized around a principal crop plant, its preferences and tolerances. It might be a staple like wheat or rice, it might be a commodity like sugar or soy or cotton. And together with my colleagues, I refer to this assemblage organized around a specific crop in a specific place and time as a cropscape. So for the last few years, I've been engaged in a project on crops in history with three other historians of agriculture. And we are producing a co-authored book entitled, as you see, Moving Crops and the Scales of History, which is coming out in February next year with Yale University Press, if we are lucky, if there's not a paper shortage. So our goal in taking crop plants and their movements as our prism in this project was to develop new and richer global histories that might apply to materials and material culture and technology in general, rather than just to crops. So to challenge conventional periodizations and geographies and scales and values, we developed this concept of cropscape. Cross your fingers, everyone. Yes. Not here, but there. Um, so the term cropscape we design we define as the ever, mutu uh, da, 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 ever mutating assemblages of non-humans and humans. So non-humans uh, <coughs> includes animals and plants, but also materials and weather, anything that is actually mobilized by humans in this context. Um, ever mutating assemblages of non-humans and humans, material, social, and symbolic elements, all these things put together within which a particular crop or crop product in a particular place and time flourishes or fails. So the example here was, if you, if you choose different lenses, um, you get different cropscapes even in the same place. Let me explain. Uh, inspired by the critical use of the landscape concept, which archaeologists and geographers have really developed. Um, for us, the scape, el scape element in this term signifies that any specific account of a cropscape, any story you choose to tell, any elements you bring together from a cropscape, is structured by the historian's choice of frame, scale, focus, and angle. So an unconventional choice of scale or focus may challenge established understandings of that particular cropscape and suggest new ways to approach crops, cropscapes in general. So in this particular case, if you look at the gardens of Amazonia where they're producing cassava, uh, there's many ways you can read this cropscape. Um, and one fun way to do it is to read it as a beerscape because Although the cassava provides food, 
what everybody really wants from the cassava is beer. So you get a different sense of the cropscape if you look at it that way. So here I'm proposing mud making as a focus which can enrich our understanding of cropscapes and the temporalities that they involve and the things that they bring together. So I'm going to start talking about the dry farming cropscapes of early North China. And contrary to popular belief, it wasn't rice, but millet was the staple grain upon which Chinese civilization, as it has endured through the centuries, was founded. And this on the right is millet. According to Chinese legend, it was Lord Millet, Ho Ji, a magical being conceived when his barren mother stepped in a footprint left in the soil by the supreme deity. It was Ho Ji who taught the ancient Chinese how to grow grain, and the grains in question were millets. These were spring-sown crops, hardy enough to survive in the semi-arid and cold, hot climate of northern China. And from early Neolithic settlements, dating back to about 6,000 BC or earlier, through the early empires and dynasties and into the modern period, early modern period, millets were the dominant staple of most of North China. They shaped its cropscapes, its farming practices, its cooking techniques, its drinking habits, its tax system, and its political rituals. And the millet belt of the North remained China's political, cultural, and economic core, the site of its capital cities and its principal tax base until 1127 AD, when the Northern Song government was defeated by Jurchen armies and set up a new capital south of, the, south of the Yangtze River. And after that, rice supplanted millet as China's iconic cereal and cropscape. Now, this came as a great surprise to me when I was invited by Joseph to start work on the agricultural volume. As I mentioned earlier, I told Joseph I didn't know anything about agriculture in China or anywhere else, and he said it didn't matter. I would soon learn. Why don't you begin, he suggested, by translating a wonderful old Chinese farming treatise called Qi Min Yashu, which is, <laughs> which is actually, I forget how many hundred thousand characters long. It's a, a little bit like saying to somebody, why don't you begin by translating the Bible? But as, all, as we all know, this is what missionaries do when they go out to civilize people. And uh, this translation certainly civilized me. So I, anyway, I set to work in my fume-ridden basement. And this work is a, is, is a wonder. It dates from about 540 AD. And Qi Min means essential techniques for the common people who may or not be peasants. It's to be debated, but anyway, people who are not officials. And it was written by an official and a state owner called Jia Sixie. And after two years toiling in the basement, I had a draft translation of over half of this masterpiece. The six volumes on the principles of tillage, millet and other cereals, oil and fiber crops, vegetables, fruit and timber trees, including a beautiful essay on the virtues and, uh, of a good hedge and its moral, <laughs> its moral impact, and an essay for producing for the market. And there were also chapters on livestock, from horses to fish. So this was an enthralling introduction to the sophistication of this northern dryland millet-based farming system at the core of which, as Jia Sixie repeatedly insists, was timing. So he says, if you follow heaven's seasons and accurately gauge the land's potential, then you will reap large rewards for little labor. But if you are willful and oppose heaven's way, then however hard you work, you will get no harvest. If you dive into a spring for timber or climb into the mountains for fish, you will always return empty-handed. If you try to sprinkle water against the wind or to roll a ball uphill, then the circumstances are against you. And then he goes on to elaborate the timing. He laid out very clearly for his readers the multiple interwoven temporalities that farmers had to consider as they struggled to reconcile conflicting or competing rhythms and contingencies. So the seasons are supposed to 
to proceed in a regular order. But then there's weather, which is not necessarily seasonal. Um, labor demands. You may need labor for one particular crop, but, but it's a peak season for another crop. How do you deal with it? Can you sell some sheep and buy some slaves? Um, seasonal fluctuations in food supplies that mean you might cho choose to grow one crop rather than another. Um, changes in market prices and so on. So I was enthralled above all by the niceness of timing that went, in, went into all this. But above all, by the craft and science of mud making, getting just the right type of soil for that particular moment in the crop cycle so that the precious seed would germinate, the promising seedlings thrive, and the grains swell to fill the ear. So Jiazashe's instructions for mud making bring together practical specifics and explanations of the natural principles or processes which they embody. So to give one example, he says, spring sowing of millet should always be deep. So draw a bush, har a bush harrow sorry, over the seed. Summer sowing should be shallow. Just sow the seed directly and leave it to sprout on its own. And then he explains, in spring, the soil is cold and germination is slow. If you don't use the harrow, the roots will spread into empty cracks in the soil. Even though the plant germinates, it will soon die. But in summer, the air is hot and germination rapid. So then if you use a harrow and it rains, the soil will, be, will become compacted and it will moisture will evaporate too fast, so you mustn't do that. So at the very heart of Jia's agronomy was the craft of keeping the soil ripe, shu, at just the right tilth and degree of moisture and fertility for the demands of the moment. And as most of you who know Chinese will know, shu is one of these terms which means it means that food is properly cooked. It means that uh, barbarians have been civilized. It means that you have become a cultivated person. Um, but it's very important in the context of keeping the soil at the right texture for the right time. So um, he describes all kinds of detailed operations where you actually have to pay attention to the plant at this moment. Um, one, th one example is that there's very little rain in North China during most of the growing season. So you really have to be able to keep it in the soil. And one way you do that is you hoe the soil repeatedly. And you hoe the soil gently so that you produce crumbs. And this is what agronomists call a dust mulch. And the dust mulch stops evaporation and controls erosion. So if you can, if you have enough people to do it, you shouldn't mind how many times you hoe. Once you've been right around the field, start again. Don't stop even for a short time simply because there are no weeds. Hoeing doesn't just get rid of weeds. It keeps the soil ripe and gives full ears with thin husks that don't shatter. So all of this was it impregnated the whole work. In every chapter, you find that this timing and the techniques that are to produce the ripe soil are specified along with all the other technical instructions you need to grow a specific crop. Um, but over and above that, you have other things. There's the timing of the seasons, and that depends on which region you're in. So you need phenological signs, like when a particular plant blooms. You have auspicious and inauspicious days that you have to take into account. If you plant beans on the wrong day, they won't come up. Um, so these calculations are factored into the life cycle of every crop. And that's one level. And then at a higher level, you have to have, a f you have to keep the field in good heart. So you have crop rotations. So he has a whole system of crop rotations. You alternate greedy crops and nourishing crops, beans and cereals, for example, to keep the land in good heart long term. The interesting thing about this productive system was that its, sex, its successful execution really depended on scale because large manorial estates of the kind that Yasushi undoubtedly possessed had sufficient land to practice crop rotations. They had enough workers to hoe the millet fields 10 times in a season. 
they had enough draft animals and equipment to plow and harrow as needed. The ruling elite of the time who owned these estates were thus at a systematic advantage, whereas peasant farmers who had only the tiny small holdings that the state distributed to them had little land to spare from the millet that they needed to eat and the millet that they needed to pay taxes with, and they often had to share animals and equipment. So the meshed principles of timing I've just described, along with those ideals of mud making for all seasons, were much more easily accessible to the privileged than they were to the poor. Now I move to Kalantan. And I went in 1976 to this part of Malaysia because the latest literature assured me that wet rice was still grown by traditional methods and that no modern machinery was used. So I thought, oh, fantastic, I can step back in time. This will be just like going into uh, Ming Dynasty Jiangnan. And of course, when I got there, they were in the middle of a green revolution. <laughs> so, <laughs> but fortunately, they were in the middle of it. So the farmers were grappling with this and I wanted to watch how they grappled. So it was very interesting for everybody. Um, so they were struggling to come to terms with the famous Green Revolution package, which is high yielding, quick ripening varieties, irrigation, and chemical fertilizers. And all these together are intended to allow farmers to double crop rice, and thus supposedly double crop their rice output. Um, the farmers were doing their very best. They, they were all trying hard, and they were getting assiduous support from the agronomists at the local agricultural development authority. Now, here is where mud making takes an interesting ethnic term, because at the time, over half the population of Malaysia was ethnically Malay. Well under half were Chinese, and about 10% were Indians. And almost all rice farmers, for reasons I'll discuss in a moment, were Malay and poor. There had been race riots in 1969, which nearly engulfed the nation in civil war. And UMNO, the United Malays National Organization, after peace was restored, became the leading party in a coalition of national unity. Its new economic policies, of which the Green Revolution projects were an important element, were designed to relieve poverty, most particularly among rural Malays, because they were a crucial voting constituency for UMNO. And you find this not just in Malaysia, of course. So when it came to the Green Revolution and its technological package, the Malaysian government was determined that this new technology should be made accessible to peasant smallholders, and it should thus avoid the social differentiation that was notoriously triggered by the adoption of Green Revolution technology in places like the Punjab. So in Malaysia, pricing policies and subsidies and agricultural development authorities ensured that the financial costs to peasant rice farmers of adopting this new technology were very low. Not, ne not negligible, but very low. When I was talking to them, however, I found it was timing as much as costs that was a stumbling, stumbling block. So Kalantan was a rice scape in that rice was a staple food and crop around which most farmers organized their lives. But it had always been a monsoon dependent crop, just grown once a year in rain fed fields. And it was just many, one of many sources of livelihood. So on land too high for water to accumulate, farmers grew rubber, fruit, and vegetables for market. In the off season, they worked as laborers. They would go to the towns like Singapore for construction jobs, or they would visit other provinces with different rainfall patterns and hire themselves out for har harvesting or transplanting rice there. Back in Kelantan, as soon as the monsoon rains began, small nursery beds were tilled and seeded with rice, and it grew for about six weeks before transplanting. And here you can see rice being taken up out of a nursery bed to be carried out and transplanted in the fields. It was then left to grow in the standing water, and the level steadily dropped once the rains ended, and 
the almost ripe rice stood actually in dry soil, which it prefers before the harvest. Once the harvest was in, in the old days pre-double cropping, it was the season for weddings and circumcisions and kite flying and wayang kulit, shadow theater. And there was about a month of celebrations. And then the farmers turned to their other jobs to earn cash. So transplanting and harvesting were periods of particularly intense labor demand and everybody was out in the fields working from dawn to dusk. This was a region of small peasant farms and there were various strategies to make this labor shortage manageable. So individual farmers would grow several different varieties of rice, some longer and sh some shorter growth period. Um, most important, however, were the labor sharing arrangements between relatives and neighbors. Same word, actually, in Malay. Uh, there was one arrangement, Berdarao, where a group shared the work on a rotational basis. So they would move from one field to another until all the work was done. And then there was another called borrowing, Pinjaman, where a farmer would provide a good meal to anybody for a day's work and one bundle of cut rice out of 20 for harvesting. And this gave people with too little land for their own needs, or people who were too old to farm, an opportunity to acquire extra rice. Come the Green Revolution, however, many Kalantan farmers found themselves unable to maintain the strict new forms of time discipline that were demanded. On the right here, you can see a translation. This is actually, obviously, quite recent, but um, I had a very poor photograph of a, a timetable board up in a rice field from, two, from 1977. Um, but it hasn't changed much. It's interesting how little this landscape and its population have changed in the last 40 years. And you can see there's really very, very little time between the different operations. And when you have rice irrigation blocks, um, everybody has to do the work at the same time. You can't say, oh, well, I'll do it next week because the water won't be there. Or, you know, your, your neighbors will be saying, well, why hasn't he done it? Because it's really stopping us from doing it. So everybody has to follow the same routine and the same rhythm or it doesn't work. And these miracle rice, as you see, being double cropped and dependent on the water supply from this large scale irrigation scheme impose these very rigorous time constraints. It was often hard to meet them, and that had significant knock-on effects. So to keep up with the schedules that typically required plowing for the new crop to begin just a few days after harvesting ended. Farmers had to abandon buffalo plows, to abandon hand sickles. They had to abandon traditional labor exchange in favor of hired tractors and reaping machines. And these were heavier equipment, and they damaged the delicate soil of the rice paddies. You might also say it was very hard giving up the party season. <laughs> no time for that anymore. Under this new time regime of double cropping, it became impossible also for most farmers to continue combining paddy production with alternative and often more profitable sources of income. These included market gardening or going away for construction work. And these are the kinds of things which would have helped pay for inputs like hiring machines, the stuff that was needed to grow the miracle rices. So irrigation had been expected to double the area under rice annually by creating the equivalent of a monsoon in the off season. But paradoxically, by raising the water table, the irrigation waterlogged the land that had once been the best for rice. And it transformed what had once been good dry land used for gardens or for rubber groves into marginal rice land. And the off season was now better for growing, than, for, for growing rice than the main season because it was easier to control the water. There was no rain. So actually, in the end, more rice land was left unfarmed during the monsoon than during the non-monsoon season. Despite these changes to boundaries between wetland and dry land, and despite the time constraints which impeded non-rice farming, the cropscape in Kelantan nevertheless morphed steadily from mixed farming to rice monoculture because it was simply so difficult to maintain 
a varied landscape. A number of the farmers I interviewed in 1976-7 and on later visits said they were giving up rice farming because the time constraints made their lives unmanageable. The Green Revolution package in Kelantan was carefully designed to serve the interests of small farmers. Yet its time disciplines and their negative impact on alternative, alternative earnings and the transformations that the new technology imposed on mud making, good mud making and its costs, triggered economic differentiation and a gradual exodus of poorer farmers to towns or to the many development schemes which the government was setting up at the time. However, a long-standing legal prohibition on turning rice land to alternative use, still in place today, uh, coupled with continuous and intensive state investments in schemes to improve rice farmer productivity and livelihoods, has kept Kelantan rice farming alive up to the present, although one might say it is an ailing sector. So now briefly to rice and silk and male and female work in South China. As I mentioned earlier, when the Sung government was driven south, it lost control of the dominant millet lands of the north, and the rice scapes of southern China became the state's source of material support. This was immediately reflected in a shift in official agronomic attention. Treatises now documented rice, not millet cultivation and a new iconography of southern rice scapes was for the first time developed and disseminated. So this picture on the right, well, both pictures are part of a classic scroll, the Gangjitu, the pictures of um, weaving, uh, sorry, uh, plowing and weaving, which was created in around 1140. And this is actually, uh, it was much reproduced, and these were actually the first picturings of southern rice agriculture. So um, having been to Kalanda was a great help in understanding what was going on and what the constraints were, the material, essential material aspects of rice farming within a system like this. I started to think of them as organized around the needs of rice and at the core of that was the control of water, the making of mud. And I noticed, as did all economic historians at the time, that rice served as an anchor for many other activities. So the productivity of a rice scape was increased by multiple cropping of paddy fields, not necessarily two crops of rice, but you could grow other crops in the fields. You could use the dry land or the hills to grow cotton or fruit or tea, and you could exercise household industries. And the labor demands all had to be fitted around the rhythms of rice. So when I was first looking at this, I was just thinking about different plants and crops and animals and so on. Um, but in 1987, I moved to UCLA, Los Angeles in California. And there, I suddenly was confronted with a new way to think about history, which had passed me by entirely in Cambridge, where I'd never heard of feminist history. <laughs> We're all feminists in our everyday lives, but we didn't, we didn't apply it in our work at that time. Um, so in the US, this was very different. Women's studies and feminist history were re had really gathered strength. And these critiques provided a new and vital optic for me because I realized that these landscapes are not just landscapes of rice. They're landscapes of rice and mulberry. And they go with the pictures of weaving silk or cotton. And these embody a neo-Confucian world order founded on the material, moral, and cosmic complementarity of men's and women's work. So the Chinese saying goes that men till and women weave, and in my terms here, mud for men and worms, silkworms for women. So I now began to appreciate that in late imperial terms, textile production too fell under the category of agriculture, no. And this was a reality that had lar largely eluded me when I was working on the SEC project, because Joseph had classified textiles under engineering and farming came under biology. So it was a different room. <laughs> you know, I just never, never made the step into the 
room two doors along the corridor, which had all the textile stuff in it. That was where Dita worked. So unlike the Chiminyashu, which had no special sections on textiles, most of the post-1000 farming treatises contained ample sections devoted to silk and cotton and the equipment needed to process them. And I now began to perceive just how tightly male and female work were intermeshed in the, cro in the cropscape, even if women by definition worked inside and men outside. And Oh, well, actually, I think you can see mulberry trees on the banks of the left-hand picture. And the mulberry trees were what sustained this, the silk industry. They were one bridge between the spheres of male and female work because the silkworms were fed on mulberry leaves. And men tended the trees and harvested the leaves. Women fed them to the worms at a rhythm determined by the worm's development. And here you see on the left, you see, I forget which number of sleep that is, but you see um, uh, the silkworms on trays in racks and the women are cleaning them and providing leaves for them. Um, there are great details about the timing of all this, but in the images you also see that um, the schedules of women's work were organized around the lives and needs of the worms, but also the lives and needs of their family. So the images of sericulture almost always show women working with their infants in their arms, or there are old people minding the boisterous toddlers, or somebody's wandering in with a dish of food. Meanwhile, the rhythms of the worms' hunger also shape men's work schedules. And furthermore, the mulberry trees themselves helped stabilize the mud system of the rice scape. So here's advice in a, a farm handbook written in 1149 at about the same time as the originals of these pictures were, were composed. So Chen Fu says, on high land, identify the places where water accumulates, dig out tanks for water storage. At the end of the spring, when the rainy season begins, heighten the banks and deepen and widen the interior of the tank to give it the best capacity. And you must strengthen the banks with mulberry trees. You can tether water buffalo to the mulberry trees and they'll be in the shade, which is what they need. And the trampling of the buffalo will strengthen the banks. And the mulberries, being well watered, will grow into fine trees. And even in the dry season, there will be sufficient water for irrigation yet in heavy rains, the tanks will not overflow and harm the crops. So the tank waters the rice fields, guarantees the mud, sustains the mulberry trees, feeds the silkworm, protects the, the buffalo, who are surprisingly delicate animals, and basically is the sort of core of this cropscape of southern China. So I'm going to conclude with some brief reflections on how these local systems of mud making fit into longer historical trends. And I'll start with this one. So these late imperial rice scapes supported a regime of commercial cropping and small scale manufacturing that famously made early modern China the world's biggest exporter of manufactured goods and importer of silver. Officials encourage the spread of this wide, this intensive rice, sorry, this intensive rice scape, which initially was most common in a small core in the Yangtze Delta, and gradually the technologies for irrigation, the techniques for growing rice, were spread partly from farmer to farmer, partly through official campaigns right through China, and when they spread these campaigns, the officials also tried to spread textile production with it. They felt that. The system was cohesive. You had to have men's work and women's work. So when they were setting up uh, sea walls or pole projects or whatever, they'd also be saying, can we set up an, a workshop where women can be taught to weave cotton? Or can we encourage them to start raising silkworms again? Often didn't work. Um, but the reason for doing this it was not just economic. It was a civilizing project. Because if you taught people to plow and weave the Chinese way, they would be able to pay their taxes, and they would also become moral 
proper Chinese subjects. So that was one of the impulses for the spread of this landscape in China. Um, obviously, a materialist in interpretation is totally valid, but we also have to remember that there was this other moral dimension, cosmic dimension even. Now, the Green Revolution was also a civilizing project, and that was intended to convert people who were considered backward, inefficient peasants vulnerable to communist subversion into modern entrepreneurial farmers. And this grand plan encountered various challenges in different contexts. And in Malaysia, one significant factor was the government's ethnic policies. So I just described uh, the fact that Malays were the people who had been conceived by actually the, the British as sons of the soil and the people who naturally grew rice, whereas in fact they probably had many other occupations and they would just grow enough rice to feed their families. Um, so this ideology of Malays as mud makers for the nation has been immensely powerful in Malaysia. Um, obvious similarities in Japan to uh, rice makers making mud for the nation. Um, so um, the government has poured money into this sector since the 1970s, and yet it has never succeeded in dragging the majority of Malays Malay rice farmers out of poverty. Their absolute living standards have risen, certainly. They now have TVs and they probably have indoor bathrooms, uh, but they've never matched other occupations. Peasant farming simply doesn't pay in Malaysia, but it is authentic. It is a national project. It is politically vital. And that is one reason why we still see these small farmer mudscapes in modern Malaysia. Meanwhile, the ostensibly archaic and marginalized milletscapes of North China have undergone a, an astonishing revival. Um, it used to be, these used to be landscapes of utmost poverty. And through the violent upheavals and titanic socialist development projects of the 20th century, many remote rural regions of China remained desperately poor. And one of them was Wang Jinduang in Hebei province. Um, during the Maoist era, Wang Jinduang became famous for terracing its hillsides using the only resources they had, their own labor, soil, and stone. And they extended these, lands these terraces from just a few right up the mountainsides. And they became a model for both for um, how the countryside should be developed and for socialist heroism in the process of doing this. So they became a model, they became heroes, but they remained very poor, very isolated. They depended on the small harvests of millet and maize grown on the terraces using donkey plows or mechanized hand tillers. But now China is a prosperous, technologically advanced nature, nation. And in the process of becoming rich, it has developed an internal tourist industry and an intensifying nostalgia for tradition. And there are growing worries about threats to the environment and food safety. And all these feed into well-funded research on alternatives to productivist mechanized agriculture. So now, Wang Jinjuang has a second accolade. It has been designated a nationally important agricultural heritage system. And visitors flood in clamoring to have their photos taken with the villagers' now famous donkeys and devouring bowls of millet in the <coughs> local hostelries, which are now regarded not as the core staple of the poor, but as a super healthy food with, a, with thousands of years of tradition. And Wang Jinjuang farmers, thanks to the cooperative, market their millet, their maize, their Sichuan pepper, their nuts across the country through the internet. And on the labels, these foods are declared as eco-crops, and they are, quotes, peasant grown and donkey manured, which you would think would make people go, yeah, but actually they say, yes, this is, this is what I must feed to my three-year-old. 
So in our current era of the Anthropocene with its fears for the environment, we see zero tillage farming methods proliferating, challenging the orthodoxy of deep plowing, FAO globally important agricultural heritage systems springing up everywhere. And these are inspiring a new agronomic research agenda. And in the process of all this, past and future rationalities and assemblages of mud making become intricately entwined. So I find it quite delightful that the harrow in this publicity photo for Wang Jinjuang could have stepped out of 1313 technology, agricultural technology manual, which was what I moved on to when I'd finished with Chi Ming Yashu. You can see all these techniques. I don't know if they're inspired by the old murals or whether they really are something that people have been doing unbroken since 1313. And this marginalized ancient staple of Wang Jinjuang millet has been rebranded as an ingredient of the middle-class Chinese diet of the future. Its value is added to by being grown in mud made the ancient way in a village coincidentally located in the very hills where the goddess Nuwa created human beings from yellow earth at the beginning of time. But the mud of today's Chinese milletscape is fertilized not just by donkey droppings, but also by use of the internet and the income that the, income that the internet generates for the farmers. So I've presented some different cases showing how farmers craft different types of mud. Mud is far more than an inert product. Both the mud itself and the water and the soil it brings together have their own characteristics and propensities. And these require farmers to work with as well as on mud. So when we consider mud as a human artifact, we perceive as historians that it can be read as something even more complex than a specific mix of soil and water. It's also a materialization of human values and relationships, of worldviews and cosmologies. And as such, the crafting of mud can reproduce a world order. It can manifest its social hierarchies and its sciences. It can generate tensions and contradictions. The three cases of mud making I discussed today have linked the history of technology to social history, to political and gender history, to the material groundings of symbolic systems, and to the agency of material practice. In the terms of the new materialism that currently animates so many innovative historical projects, mud is, quotes, vibrant matter. I hope I have convinced you of this, and I hope I have conv convinced you today that mud is a matter of, his, of serious historical attention. Thank you very much. Francesca, thank you very much for a, a, a wide-ranging uh, a, a wonderful lecture. You have not muddied the waters, so <laughs> to speak, but you've uh, you've treated us, you know, with clarity, you know, to uh, a number of wonderful reflections here. Um, it is the tradition <coughs> of this lecture to invite you know, the audience you know, for to offer some comments or questions, and you know, to continue the conversation afterwards over a drink upstairs. Uh, and Francesca <coughs> you know, uh, is, is very happy you know, to, take, to take a few questions. So uh, the floor is open. Um, I suggest that I hand you over a microphone and perhaps, Jen, you, you, could, you could use this one on that side. That makes, makes discussion a little bit easier. <coughs> I, wonder, I wonder, Francesca, whether I could sort of... sort of... Uh, <coughs> ask you about where in your in your in your notion of 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 of, of the scape or the crop scape uh, human beings figure i'm always fascinated when i read early chinese texts that deal with even the taxonomy of soils for example that they always seem to suggest that the human beings who live on it are actually also a crop in other words their psychology their behavior their temperament mm. is 
influenced by the land on which you live and thereby moving populations you know from one habitat to another is always problematic and so i was wondering you know in your in your sort of notion of of the cropscape whether or not you know sort of you you conceive of 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 uh, not simply you know sort of people manipulating the mud but the mud actually sort of forging the character of the human beings who work it yes well i think uh, that that's very clear in this notion of you know the 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 men men plow and women weave um actually engaging in these activities, these material activities, is something which in the elite Chinese philosophy is going to provide, is going to make people a certain kind of moral subject um, as individuals, as families, as communities. And at the same time as I mentioned in passing, it's, it's also this cosmic relationship because if people have the right relationship with between men and women, but also the right relationship with following the seasons and following the way and uh, evaluating the soils in the right way, then this is part of the uh, harmonious human political field that will maintain a regime in power. So for the elite, um, for officials, for official philosophy, I think this is this is certainly one dimension of that. Um, I'm I'm afraid I ought to have studied peasant proverbs, but I haven't. And I know that in all those wonderful peasant sayings that have been preserved and collected, and that I think Richard Smith has been working on, um, there would be a much more down to earth. Uh, version of what happens when you, you know, when you're grabbing around in the mud. Um, and then there's, of course, the medical, ver the medical dimension of this, which um, Elizabeth would know better than I, but um, certainly by the late imperial period, there was a very strong idea that you were a creature of the clay in which you grew up, and that your physiology your health propensities, the kinds of treatment that you should be given under certain circumstances all depended on where you initially came from and you had grown out of this land. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, one mud that came to mind and that changed the whole world is mud made for ceramics, porcelain. Um, does that mud have a place in your in your world of mud? And, and um, if you could just sort of um, share your thoughts on mud for ceramics. Well, I. I've left the ceramics to the ceramic experts happily, um, but clearly, you know, the nature of the mud that you use for ceramics has a big influence on what kinds of ceramics you make. And the other day, there was a wonderful seminar, webinar, um, in, uh, organized by people in Venice on, uh, was it the Longchan kiln? No, you know, um, Yaozhou kilns. And in presenting this, um, not Rose Kerr, the other author of the SCC volume, the, I'm forgetting his name. No, 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 uh, a man. Um, and he's, sorry? Oh, okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> Nigel, Wood. Nigel Wood. Nigel Wood. So Nigel Wood presented this um, this this slide, which suddenly made it all make sense in a way, um, that actually uh, North and South China are on two different tectonic plates. So the nature of the soils in North and South is completely different. So if you want to understand the ceramics of the North and the ceramics of the South, and I imagine this 
dates back to the Lith Neolithic period and the completely different styles, uh, you, you need to understand exactly what kinds of soil ceramicists were working with. But I think um, it's my understanding that in China, people, kilns always were local. They always worked with the local clays. You didn't import it from somewhere else. So if you came to the end of your clay, you had to move elsewhere. Um, and this was presumably typical of most early um, ceramics around the world. But of course, it became absolutely transformed later, and notably in the porcelain industries of Europe, where, you know, if you could, anywhere you found something which looked right for making porcelain, you built a railway line and you took it to Wedgwood's factory or Meissen or wherever it would be. So a completely different attitude towards the rooted nature of the ceramics. Thank you for your, for your amazing lecture, the connotation of different crosscapes to different regimes of historicity and the corresponding sovereign, uh, political and social economic structure. It's really, really interesting. Um, I have two questions. I, first, uh, your, 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 your presentation on the crosscape of rice and silk is really, really interesting. I'm wondering how that is corresponding to the larger like neo Confucian, like statecraft project of ordering the world. Yeah, that's my first question. And the second question is that I, I noticed that you use the world craft and technique, technique repeatedly. I find that to be very interesting. Is that intentional? Because there's to a certain degree a certain modern connotation to the word craft and technique. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, um... Very interesting questions. Um, so I think, yes, the rice and silk, I presented it as rice and silk, which is in the terms of the Chinese neo-Confucian statecraft world, world ordering uh, project. Um, but they allowed cotton. <laughs> and cotton was, of course, more and more important. And gradually, cotton was absorbed as official women's work into this neo-Confucian world ordering. But the problem was that as the economy grew, more and more of the weaving of cotton moved into urban workshops, which were operated by men. So this was not good. Uh, it created a lot of uh, social, uh, a lot of debate and, and uh, fears for social problems and the world being turned upside down. So um, I think with other feminist historians, we, we think about the difference between women's work and womanly work. Both of them would be new gong, but um, one would be the kind of work which the cosmos approves of and which maintains the social order and which may not even actually generate income. Um, but, you know, it sustains the family, it sustains the community, it produces garments for mourning and garments for weddings and all those things which actually are very important. It's not just Neo-Confucians who say that. Um, cloth is, textiles are the fabric of society. But, um, but then when it comes to the disruptions of industrial well, manufacturingization, not industrialization, but you know, they become uh, commercial industries and, and the gender relations are really subverted. Um, it takes several centuries, I think, for Confucian officials to really come to terms with that and still find women still perceive women doing womanly, womanly work, even if maybe it is embroidery or um, making dofu or something, you know, which doesn't really enter the canon at all. So I think I'll, in the interests of time and everybody needing a drink, I will, <laughs> I will go on to the crops and techniques thing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I've, I've grasped the full meaning of what you say. 
but um, these are, of course, terms that I'm imposing. Uh, there are Chinese terms which correspond to crop and which you find, I don't think they change very much. I think they're much the same throughout, but they usually, you know, there's a generic for crops, but then there are the five grains that are the, okay. I meant craft. Craft. Oh, craft, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yes. Well, I'll have to go and think about crop, crops as well. Crafts, um, yeah. Uh, I'm using the term crafts and techniques because they are the, or, not the opposite, but they are in contrast to, in counterposition to industry and machinery. Uh, so this is a very long debate as you know, in the history of industrialization and does craft, can, can you have craft in modern technology? Um, or can you have techniques in modern technology or is it all built into the machine so that humans just switch them on and off? Um, but I think that I called it the craft of mud making <coughs> because most people think about mud as just, you know, something that's there and something that happens. It's something that doesn't need to be skillfully made. And a craft means making something skillfully. And a technique refers to having a set of procedures for doing something. So this was what I wanted to bring out. And the crop question, had you asked it, would have been very interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francesca, for that expectedly fascinating talk. My question is one that is very brief and no doubt easy to answer with a few sentences. And it stems from the fact that you may remember when I was a callow youth, I used to be a fanatical anti-Marxist. Now, I have just come back recently from giving about my hundredth talk about Joseph Needham and the Science and Civilization in China project. And I find I have to explain as part of that what Marxism was as a project, what it meant to Joseph Needham and so on. And in the, in the course of doing so, about a hundred times, I become more and more convinced that Marxism is a really fascinating, you know, though ultimately failed, but a scientific attempt to make sense of how we came to be like this. And it occurs to me as I listen to you how difficult it would be to raise rice and want to eat rice any other way than the ways that you have described there, and so on, no doubt, Millet, too, demands of people that they should act in a certain way. But you distinguish slightly from that the moral demands of the officials who come down and do that. To what extent does it make any sense still to try to say, well, actually, the superstructure of Confucian officials telling you how your society should be ordered is simply due to the fact that the base, the productive base of society, was, say, a particular kind of agriculture. Would you still ever allow yourself to, to ask a question like that? Because I've only just come very late to asking that kind of question. I'm not a convert, but, you know, it seemed a damn sight more interesting and useful to think that way than I used to think it was. And I would invite <laughs> you perhaps just to solve, answer my question in a few brief and pregnant phrases. Oh, th thank you, Chris. <laughs> Well, technological determinism is a sin. Oh, thank you. God says so. <laughs> <laughs> Will that do? <laughs> a couple more, if you could. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm still a technological determinist at heart because I think you can get a long way with starting out from there, and then you can oh. add in all the other things. And I, what I like about the Marxism particularly is that it points to the contradiction in the mode of contradictions in the mode of production which is a way of thinking about things that I find very helpful. But um, I do think that the northern farming system as described by Jiao Xie meshes very well with a feudal official system that provides large estates. Uh, I mean, obviously, not everybody had a large estate, but peasant, peasant farming couldn't achieve the same level of stability for the people concerned. It was very precarious. And rice farming in the South, long term, I think did mesh very well 
with a political system of absentee landlordism, if you like, lack of interference by landowners in the way that small farms were operated. And it didn't make everybody happy all of the time, but it, it, uh, it meant that the state could still feel that it was in direct contact with a huge small peasantry. And it was always trying to get rid of the landlords, obviously, but you know, it was, it was not quite such an anxious and tense and, and, and precarious relationship as it had been before the, you know, up until the Anusha Nadalian in the 8th century in the north. I'm <clears throat> Francesca, I'm, I'm conscious of time, yes. and I, I'm remem I'm, I recall that picture on your first slide of you behind that buffalo. You know, sort <laughs> of, and, and, and so we've been actually, you know, sort of having you uh, craft mutt, you know, for quite a while. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I maybe we'll have we, we'll, we'll take one final question, and then we can continue oh. the conversation, you know, upstairs over a drink, perhaps. But there's one more question. Okay, I'll just ask a quick and final question. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Gray, <laughs> and in your like in the final slide of the presentation, you mentioned the middle state in northern China, how the middle in recent decades transformed from like a substance as a farming food in the third point northern um, used to like a new craze among the rising Chinese middle class. So I was just wondering. Can I'm not quite sure exactly how it came about, but it's uh, it's not just China; it's the rest of the world yeah, where yeah, where yeah, the yeah. where there are rich people who eat too much. Um, <laughs> they start thinking of uh, what used to be coarse foods as healthy and full of bran and vitamins and not so processed and so on. So I think um, the the different in what becomes suddenly a desirable food um, in different countries is, is very interesting. So we haven't yet had a revival in the United Kingdom or as far as I know in Ireland of uh, you must eat more potatoes because it's really healthy because <laughs> we all know that what people really want to eat is French fries and that's not really healthy. Um, but oats for example, have really come back in Europe and they were a famine. Well, they weren't a famine food. They were a poor peasant, dreadful climate food. Um, in China, I think it's really interesting how, how all these food cultures have really joined a sort of global movement. Um, and how the government is encouraging them also because it is worried about increasing obesity and increasing diseases of modernity and so on. And yet there's another element there which I've been trying to find out more about but I haven't yet managed to find out so much, not being a good scientist. Um, but I know that many of these crops are also regarded as being the kinds of crops which would be good for climate change, marginal soils, use of less fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, and so on. So there's some quite big research programs going on, many of them at provincial level rather than national level, which are trying to improve breeds and cultivation techniques for these crops. Um, and of course, the fact that you can then market them and uh, market them on Tawa. <laughs> It's an added incentive to farmers to try and uh, to grow them. But the um, Wang Jinjuang is completely different from Qinzhou, just across, uh, where they're doing a completely different way of, uh, you know, growing it. But thank you so much, and thank you also for your help with the materials. <laughs>
Well, thank you all for all your questions. And please do continue the conversation. I believe, Sue, it's upstairs. Is it the El Elton Bowering Room, which is two floors up, same building. Um, <coughs> but please uh, do not leave us before we thank Francesca for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.